Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this Sunday service for Sunday, the 13th of March, 2022. I'm recording this now to put it on YouTube for those of you who will not be able to join us for the live service. So wherever you are, whatever you're doing, hope that you will enjoy this uh, short time, Lord, short time of uh, song and God's word that we spend together. So let me pray now as we start, and then we'll have our first song. We thank you, Lord, for technology. Thank you for the opportunity to share your word, your living word. And I pray, Lord, that you will bless each person listening to this message. And that, Lord, you will help me as I bring the message. Help me, Lord, to get all the technology things correct, correctly done. And give us open hearts, Lord, to focus on you today, Lord, please. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, I'll share my screen with you, and we'll get ready for our, our first song which is one I'm sure that you'll know, beautiful song, I, I Exalt You. Beautiful song, and we do that, Lord, we do exalt you. We lift your name up on high, because you are a great God. You give us the privilege, Lord, of being called your children. You are worthy of all praise. You are seated on the throne in heaven, high, exalted, and lifted up. Lord, you know there are many things happening around us, both locally, in New Zealand, nationally, and around the world, internationally. 
We pray, Lord, for those that we know, particularly in our own church family, Lord, who are uh, struggling with COVID at the moment, Lord. Omicron is so is spreading so fast and many people have been affected by it. We just pray, Lord, for those who have it or recovering from it, Lord, and they will quickly recover, Lord, and get back to normal again. Bless those that work in the hospital system, Lord, as they have to care for many, Lord, just in the ordinary hospital wards and those who are in ICU. We continue to pray, Lord, for our government in this country, Lord, that you will give them godly wisdom to make right and just decisions, Lord. And we pray for the war in Ukraine. Lord, we hear different things in the media, Lord. We don't always know what's true. But we do know, Lord, that we can ask you to be involved, Lord. We pray for your miracles of protection, Lord, and the people there. And we pray for an open door for the gospel. Many people who are scared and grieving and hurt and lost will open their hearts to you, Lord, and find you and your saving power. We do ask, Lord, for a swift end to this war, Lord, so that innocent people don't need to lose their lives. So, Lord, please, will you work in that situation? Lord, and we bring our own personal circumstances to you, each one of us, in this few seconds of quiet now. So we thank you, Lord, that you hear all of our prayers and you are seated on the throne, Lord. You are in control. Please work on our behalf, Lord, for the glory of your name. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let me share my screen with you again. If you've been following these videos or been able to attend the Zoom service, you know that I've been focusing on the first three chapters of Genesis. We've already been through uh, Genesis 1, and we've had the uh, beginning of Genesis 2, so now we're going to continue with Genesis 2, verses 4 to 25. It's quite a long passage, but I'll read it, and you'll see it there on the screen as well. So Genesis 2, from verses 4 to 25. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden, and there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground, trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. Aromatic resin and onyx are always also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. The Lord God said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, 
it took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife, and they become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. May God add his blessing to his word. All right. Okay, so I'll share my screen with you again. Okay, there's not one specific title uh, from this chapter. I've just called it Thoughts from Genesis Chapter 2, because there are a few things in here which we can, we can learn, and I hope uh, the thoughts that I share will be useful for you. Okay, so if we look at Genesis 1 as against Genesis 2, a closer reading of the text will reveal one striking difference between the two chapters. If we read Genesis 1, it mentions the word God, 32 times in the beginning god created the heavens and the earth god said let there be light god said it was good god separated the night and the day uses the word god many times however when we come into genesis 2 it doesn't use the word god anymore it uses the phrase the lord god not as many times, 11, but there's a difference between the word God and the word the Lord, the words the Lord God. That might not seem too significant, but actually it's very significant. If we look at the word God, that's translated in Hebrew as the word Elohim. And the emphasis on Elohim is God who is our creator. Same as when we ask people, do you believe in God? Does God exist does elohim exist it's more like a title so it's saying god is our creator god created god did this and god did that but genesis chapter 2 we've got the word yahweh and this is not a title but god's personal name used in the context of having a relationship with his people so when we get into genesis 2 we see god's dealings with uh, adam and later with eve and then God uses a totally different name, showing us that God is a God of relationship. Yes, he is the powerful Elohim, the powerful creator, but he's also Yahweh, our personal God that we can have a relationship with. We all know the words hallelujah, and that comes from two words, halal, which means joyful praise, and Yah is short for Yahweh. So hallelujah, praise the Lord, praise our personal God. We don't mean God is our little God, our impersonal little God, but God that we can have a personal relationship with as his name. We can call him Yahweh. Just if you're interested, the Jews came to think of the word Yahweh as being so holy, they didn't want to say the word. They started to change it for the word Adonai. So Adonai in Hebrew means my Lord. We've got Elohim, Yahweh, and Adonai. So our passage for today starts off in verse 4, and it's extremely clear where the heavens and the earth came from. This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created. It's a passive tense, means they were created by someone. They didn't just happen. And who did that? When? Yahweh, the Lord God, made the earth and the heavens. The Bible gives us no doubt at all that God is a creator God. It's our Lord God who made the earth and the heavens. So Genesis 1 gives us a broad overview of the creation story. And Genesis 2 actually goes back and gives us more detail about that. Genesis 2 verse 7 tells us how we were made. 
Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and the man became a living being. So whether we like it or not, we were formed from dust. The dust of the earth doesn't sound too flattering, does it? But that's all God needed to make us. God took the dust of the ground and his breath. That's what made us. You know, in modern days, we've got the periodic table with all the elements. Everything that's in the ground, in the dust, comes in here. So question for you, how many elements are there in the periodic table? Anyone know the answer? A, B, or C? Have a think, have a think. Don't count all the squares. The answer is B. There are 118 different elements in the periodic table. And how many of those are normally found in the human body? We're complicated creatures. We're made up of many kinds of elements. Is it 47A, 63B, or 83C? Answer is actually C. That's right. Our body has 83 different elements in it, in different proportions, of course, but we have 83 of those elements in the periodic table inside our bodies. Just thought I'd test your, little, your knowledge again. So from these four, I want you to think which of these elements are not usually found in the human body. Is it uranium? Is it krypton? As you're probably aware of from the Superman stories. Is it nobelium? Is it gold? Do our bodies have gold? Which one don't we have? The answer is C, nobelium. Nobelium is not in our bodies. So yes, we do have uranium. We do have krypton and we do have gold in our bodies in very small amounts, but they're there. We've been created in an amazing way from the dust or the elements of the earth. This is the breakdown showing us what uh, we're mostly made up of uh, oxygen and then carbon and hydrogen, nitrogen and calcium, and then all those others making the total of 83. God's really amazing the way he's created us. And that's a wonderful thing to remember that we're made from the dust. This psalm uh, hints at that. Psalm 103 verses 13 to 16 tells us the way that God cares for us. As a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion on those who fear him. For he knows how we are formed. He remembers that we are dust. Remember, Adam was made from the dust. We too are made from the dust. The life of mortals is like grass. They flourish like a flower of the field. Beautiful, but the wind blows over it and it's gone. And its place remembers it no more. We are weak human beings, but God knows that. He knows how we're formed and he has compassion on us, his children. Isn't that beautiful? And it wasn't just the dust of the earth that God took, took, but God also had to breathe into it. So the very life breath that we have comes from God. Without his breath, there is no life. It was only when God breathed the breath of life that the man became a living being. Spiritually speaking as well, if we go to the New Testament, to John chapter 3, when Jesus was talking to Nicodemus, he said, very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless they are born of water and the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that gives us that spiritual life. After Jesus died and rose again, he said to his disciples in John 20, 21 and 22, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. So God's breath gives us a physical life. But God's breath also gives us spiritual life and spiritual power through the Holy Spirit in us. We need both. Physically, we are weak. Spiritually, we are weak. We need God's power, the power of the Holy Spirit to help us each day. Just a little note, where was the Garden of Eden? As with many places in the Bible, people have often tried to find them. And because of the names of the rivers, especially the river Tigris, 
and the river Euphrates, which still exists today, the Garden of Eden is often placed uh, in modern Iraq, or even sometimes in Turkey. But we need to remember Noah and the flood. When the flood covered all the earth, a lot of these places would have been disappeared, and the people would have renamed places after the floods subsided. So maybe uh, the river Tigris and river Euphrates are in a different position to what they were before. It's basically saying we don't know where the Garden of Eden was. We just got some indication from modern day geography. But it doesn't really matter. It's not there now. So remember last time in our message, we looked at the beginning of Genesis chapter 2. And the title of that message was We Were Created to Rest. And we looked at three principles. Why did God give us a day of rest? One was because, and most important, it's the Sabbath to the Lord your God. God wants us to take a day of the week when we focus on him. When we go to church, if possible, we spend time with believers, we read God's word, and we hear God's word, we spend time alone in prayer with God. It's a Sabbath to the Lord. The other two principles are about rest and refreshment. God knows that we need rest to recover physically. And we need to be refreshed after a busy week. That could involve all sorts of different things. So remember that it's important that we get enough rest. But the rest only comes after the work. So again, whether you feel happy about this or not, we were created to work. The Bible right at the beginning sets down the pattern. In Genesis 2, 5, now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth and no plant had yet sprung up the Lord God, as our Yahweh again, had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. And down in verse 15, the Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden, not just to look at all of its beauty and enjoy the animals, though that was part of it, but to work it and take care of it. God gave Adam a task to do gave him work to do. That was part of his purpose. This was even before sin entered into the world. This was before the fall. Adam was given a job to do. So we too were created to work. Just a few verses on, on work. So Exodus 20 verse 9 says very clearly, six days you shall labor. Labor means work, doesn't it? And do all your work. So we, we're called to work. We're created to work. Psalm 90 verse 17 says, May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. So establish is to build and to make strong. So we're asking God to bless the work that we do. Make it successful. Lord, please bless the work that we do. This is a beautiful verse in Colossians 3.23. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. This is a key, I believe, in work. Whatever we do, we're working for the Lord. It might be a paid job. It might be a volunteer job. It might be at home looking after family and children. It doesn't matter. They're all important. But whatever we do, work at it with all our heart as working for the Lord. Really important principle. 2 Thessalonians 3.10 For even when we were with you, we gave you this rule. The one who is unwilling to work shall not eat. That's pretty clear, isn't it, on the necessity, necessity to work. If we don't work, we don't eat. That's the way God's set it out to be that's the pattern that he's given us so we, we need to work god created us to work elizabeth elliot the wife of the murdered and martyred missionary jim elliot had this to say about work work is a blessing god has so arranged the world that work is necessary and he gives us hands and strength to do it the enjoyment of leisure would be nothing if we had only leisure it's the joy of work well done that enables us to enjoy rest, just as it is the experiences of hunger and thirst that make food and drink such pleasures. 
And I like that, that sentence there, God has so arranged the world that work is necessary. That's God's way. So when we're at work, when we're with friends, when we're at school, when we're at university, it's a great place to share God. We're often with people in those workplaces or in our neighborhood or friends a lot, and they get to see our lives. It was a great opportunity. And as we go about our daily lives, whatever kind of work we're doing, again, paid or unpaid, we can pray for opportunities to share our faith with those around us. Let God lead us. We can't make people become Christians. That's God's job, the job of the Holy Spirit. So we shouldn't try to make people become Christians, but of course we can share his love with them. You remember show and tell? In school sometimes they ask people, ask the kids to bring something along, show it to the class and tell them about it. So we need to do the same. Don't just tell people about God. We need to show it in our Christian character show it in the way that we relate. And that's a big responsibility and can be scary. People are watching us the way that we live our lives. The way that we treat people will be noticed. Even those that are not so ni nice to us, how do we treat them? I've been in workplaces before where I've been treated pretty badly and it's not easy at all, but we're called to treat people with consideration. People don't expect us to be perfect, so we shouldn't be afraid to show people our own flaws. If people think that we are perfect and never have any wrong, anything wrong, they're going to think, oh, these Christians are all perfect. I'm not. I can never be like that. So it's okay to be honest. You did, we've done something wrong. We've got a weakness. Share that. We're human. Sometimes when people ask us questions, they, they want an answer, and we honestly don't know what the answer is. So we shouldn't be afraid to say, you don't know. You can say, yeah, I don't know what the answer is to that question. I can try my best to find out. Can we talk about this again? But don't be afraid to say you don't know. We don't know everything. When we're talking with Christians, we should avoid Christian, Christian jargon, Christianese, like sanctified and justified. And all these things that people hear them, they think, oh, what are you talking about? Just keep it plain and keep it simple. And remember, helping people to know God is a process, not an event. It can be an event occasionally when there is a specific, God has a specific moment when he wants that person to become a Christian. But it's often as a result of a process. And people will be looking at us as we have relationships with them, as we have friendships with them, and then see the kind of person we are that then gives them an insight into our lives and they'll think, why are you not flustered when this difficult thing's happening? How come you're not worried when the other people seem so worried? You can say, oh yeah, I am worried sometimes, but when I'm worried, I try first to go to God and talk to him about it. And the promises in his word give me peace. So if there's anything you want me to pray for for you, just, just let me know. I'd be very happy to pray for you very naturally, through relationship. Which leads very nicely onto my, my next point. We were created for relationship. Verse 18, the Lord God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make a help, helper suitable for him. Verse 20, but for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God did something about it and made, made the woman. So that's a, a, a key sentence there. It's not good for the man to be alone. Now, just a, a little note on that word helper. When the, the, the verse says, I will make a helper suitable for him. There's been some misunderstanding about that word. And the word is, trend, the Hebrew word there is ezer, the word for helper. There's a theologian and professor called Linda Belleville. And she says that all 19 occurrences of the word Ezer in the Old Testament are about assistance that one of strength offers to one in need. It could be help from God or the king, an ally or an army. There's no exception. 
So when God is saying, I will make a helper in Genesis 2.18 to describe the one created to relieve man's aloneness, this is meaning is it's done through strong partnership in the words of Dr. Belleville. Remember, man and woman were both made in God's image. I think that's a beautiful picture. Man was alone. He needed someone to help him. And God made a strong partnership, both of them together. This passage is clearly talking about marriage because it says that the man and woman will leave their parents and come together as one, one flesh. But we can see clearly from the Bible that for all of us, it's not good to be alone so not talking just about being married or being single here, but we were made for relationship. Lots of examples in the Bible. Proverbs 27, 9, perfume and incense bring joy to the heart and the pleasantness of a friend springs from their heartfelt advice. We need friends. We need people that we can talk to, people that we can go to for advice. Very important. Romans 1, 11 to 12. So it's Paul writing, and he said, I long to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to make you strong. That is that you and I may be mutually encouraged by each other's faith. Isn't that a cool thing? We need each other to mutually encourage each other. Some of you will know the Promise Keepers Christian Men's Conference that happens uh, every year. It's actually been cancelled the last couple of years due to COVID, but I've been a part of that uh, Promise Keepers Conference in Auckland for well, probably about 15, 16 years now, and I've been part of the choir. As we only meet up once a year, we only get to see each other once a year. We have several practices uh, for the choir, and I love the fact that I can go there each year and see some of the same guys year in, year out, still going on in their faith, with their struggles probably, but they're still there. They're still going on, and that encourages me, and hopefully I encourage them. So friends, we can mutually encourage each other. And of course, the Bible talks about the body of Christ, Romans 12. So in Christ we, though many, form one body. And this is quite a powerful sentence. Each member belongs to all the others. Just like our body parts or part of us, we as uh, Christians in the church belong to each other. We weren't made to be lone rangers. We weren't made to go it alone. We need people around us to encourage us. So yes, this is talking about marriage, but also I believe it's a wider principle that we need each other. We need people. So in summary, Genesis 2 teaches us that God is describing himself in a new way, not in a sense the distant, far away, powerful creator God, Elohim, but God who wants relationship with us, Yahweh. And that's a great encouragement to me to know that God is my Yahweh. I can come to him in relationship. We were made by God in an amazing way from dust, and the fact that he created us in itself is fantastic. But we were, we were made of dust. So sometimes we struggle. And basically we're made from dust. We're going to struggle. We're very human. But God knows that. And God understands that. We know, learn that we are created to rest. That's really important. Physical rest also contributes to spiritual rest as well. They're all inter, intertwined, interwoven. So make sure that we get enough rest in times of refreshment. We were created to work. This is obviously going to be different at different stages of life, but we've all got work to do in different areas, and that's the way that God wants it to be. And finally, we were created for relationship in the body of Christ, so with friends. So let's make sure that we keep those relationships because they're very important. So that's our message for today. All right, we're going to go now to our closing song, and then I will finish in prayer. There is a Redeemer, Jesus.
Thank you, O oh my Father, for giving us your Son and leaving your Spirit till the work on earth is done. Thank you, Lord, that you've created us to work. I do pray for each of us, Lord, in our daily work, whatever that might be, paid or unpaid, that you'll help us, Lord. Give us strength, give us wisdom to do the work that you've called us to do and to do it well. Give us opportunities, Lord, to share you with those around us, where that's appropriate in our different situations. We thank you too that you've made us for a relationship. We all need people, Lord, that we can talk to, that we can ask when we're in trouble. We can ask somebody to pray for us, people that we can share fun with. Thank you, Lord, you've given us our families, our church family and friends around us. So thank you, Lord that we can have that relationship with you, but you also call us to have relationships one with another. Help us to remember, Lord, in the midst of the busyness, to also rest as well, because that's also your command, Lord, that we need to get enough rest. So we thank you, Lord. Please encourage us. We pray for this week ahead, Lord. Again, you'll keep us safe. You'll help us to walk with you, Lord, through the week, knowing that your promise to never leave us is true. Not just a theory, it's true practically, Lord. You've promised never to leave us, never to forsake us. So we give you the praise and the honor in Jesus' name. Amen. 
But thank you for joining us for this service and we'll see you again next time. Thank you and God bless. Bye-bye.